I mean, they got like monster water drops, pummels you, you know. Well, uh, in one sense, what God is saying, the rain that comes from him is going to be gentle rain, almost like the dew on the grass. In the Bible, the dew speaks of the resurrection of the dead. That's what you have to know. Whenever it mentions dew, it's talking about the resurrection of the dead. Now, we know they always pray for rain at Sukkot, all right? And rain is to be considered a blessing. This is why in the Song of Songs, here the bride of Messiah is in the house and doesn't want to go out. And the Messiah is coming and says, it's pouring down rain outside. But it's not because he wants in. He wants her to come out and enjoy the blessings. And so this is how we should look at the rain. We should love it. Look at Hosea 6.3. It says, let us know, eagerly strive to know the Lord, because his going forth is sure as the morning. And look at this. He's going to come to us as the rain, as the latter rain that waters the earth. A lot of Christians think the latter rain, uh, you know, is at the wrong time from when it's supposed to be. Uh, And you can tell that from the Hebrew words when it's a spring rain or a fall rain. But look at Ezekiel 34, 26. And I will make them in the places around my hill a blessing. I will cause the shower to come down in its season, and there will be showers of blessing. So again, when you're facing the rain, think of it in terms of God's word. Think of it in terms of God's blessing. But look at this. He comes to us as the rain. Okay? The former rain and the latter rain. So what do we have? We have the rain centered around Sukkot and around Passover. That's the spring rains and the fall rains. The first time he came as the rain was in the spring. Now he's coming in the fall. And it is all based on the rains because that is what a blessing is. Now in Deuteronomy 33.1, this is where our Torah portion begins. It says, and this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. I mean, think about it. Here he's about to die. And before Moses dies, Deuteronomy 33 is like the day he dies. But before he dies, he blesses the children of Israel. Well, guess what? What did Yeshua do right before he ascended? He blessed the disciples. As a matter of fact, look at Luke 24, 50 and 51. He led, them, he led them out until they were over against Bethany. That is the top of the Mount of Olives. That's where he is, at the top of the Mount of Olives. And it says, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. What do you think he did when he lifted up his hands? It wasn't like this, hallelujah. It was like this. And he's doing the priestly blessing. That's the blessing he's blessing them with before he ascends. And then it says he parted them and was carried up into heaven. Now, look at this next verse. It says in right before those verses in 36 through 40, it says, as they spoke, Yeshua standing in the midst Can you imagine? He's standing here, and there's a circle of disciples. They're all around him, or a half circle. And they're all just, they're talking. You know, they're probably not more than three or four feet away from each other. And it says, he said, peace be to you. They were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my what? And when they looked down at his feet, what do you think they saw? The nail prints. And when they looked at his hands, they saw the hand prints. And so he says, look, behold, my hands and my feet, it is I, myself. Handle me, touch me. Look, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Do you realize that means when we have our new body, there will be flesh and bones. 
And then he says, and when he had spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Can you imagine? They're all around him when he goes to ascend, and they're looking at him, talking to him. And when he raises his hands to bless them, what does every Jew do when the priest raises his hands? They look down. Because it's like the power of God is going to be coming through the hands and hitting them. So they all look down. So what does he do? He raises his hands and they see the nail prints in his hands. He says the blessing. They look down. And what are they looking at? His feet. The nail prints in his feet. And while they're looking at the nail prints in his feet, he starts ascending. And I can just see them looking at the footprints as they look up. What a blessing. Now, it's all about the feet, it says here, right? Well, guess what? There are three feasts that are known as three feet. It's called the Shalosh Regalim. And that's because there were three feasts. Everyone had to foot it to Jerusalem. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Or Shavuot and Sukkot. So those three feasts, when everyone had to come, were known as the Shalosh Regalim, or the foot feasts. Now, with that in mind, let's look at Acts 1, 9 through 11. And when he had said these things, as they were looking, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who said, you men of Galilee, why are you looking up into heaven? This Yeshua, who was received up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you beheld him going into heaven. And where are they standing? Mount of Olives. And where does he return to? And it's going to split in two when his feet land on the Mount of Olives. And guess what? How many of you know he left Jewish? Oh, he's coming back Jewish. He's going to return the same way he left. Okay, now let's look at Acts 1, 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath state journey. Okay, so that's where they were, the Mount of Olives. Now we see in Exodus 23, 14 and 17, three times you're to keep a feast to me in the year. You're to keep the feast of unleavened bread. That's at Passover time. Uh, where you're to eat unleavened bread seven days in the time appointed uh, because that's when you came out of Egypt and no one better appear before me empty. Then it says the feast of harvest, that's Shavuot or Pentecost, the first fruits of your labors, which you've sown in the field, and the feast of in gathering, which is at the end of the year, which is the feast of Sukkot. Does everyone understand that? But do you understand at the end of the year is that Sukkot, the beginning of the year is that Sukkot? And this is in the Torah. Because so many people will say, the only year is Nisan 1. No, there's four years in Judaism. You have your civil year, which is Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah, because that's when man was created. It's for all of the world. Then you have Nisan 1, when Israel got led out of Egypt, so it becomes the first year on the religious calendar. They also have a calendar uh, to the Shabbat, for when you determine the time for the trees is, because according to the Torah, you couldn't eat the fruit of a tree for the first four years. Well, what if you plant it in September? Okay, uh, well now it's February, Tuba Shabbat, is it a year old, six months old? So there's also a year for calendars, then there's also a year for tithing on cattle and the likes, which is a low one. So anyway, there's four calendars. Now, in Exodus 34, uh, 23 and 24, it says three times in the year, all your males have to come before the Lord. But look at this. It says, I'm going to send out the nations before you and make wide the limits of your land. And no one will make an attempt to take your land while you go up to worship the Lord during these three times. I mean, can you imagine if all the men in the entire nation of Israel, several hundred miles long, all go to Jerusalem, don't you think the enemy is going to say, hey, just the women and children are there, let's go and attack them. So every man is going to be concerned about leaving their wives and children behind and the enemy coming to get them. So what happened? All the women and children came with them. 
So the towns were completely empty. But think, why wouldn't the enemy go in and take it? That's the easiest time for a war when it's uninhabited. You can take it over. That just shows you God's in control, and God's the one who wrote this book. Because if a man wrote that book, they would never say that. Go figure. Okay, now, again, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times the year, all your males appear before the Lord. And why did they command the men and not the women? The women weren't commanded to go. That's because they don't need to be told what to do. The men need to be told what to do. Okay. Uh, but the reason why is if the men are farmers, the men don't want to quit their job and working in the farm unless they have a good reason to. And so God gave them the reason. The women naturally come. The women love the fellowship. It's all relational to them. So the women are going to come anyway. He doesn't have to tell them. Okay. And he mentions that again in Deuteronomy 16 and 17. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, and the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. And so those were known as the Shalom Regalim. Now, these are foot feasts commanded by God. Your feet have to be there, right? Why do you think the Lord's feet land at the Feast of Tabernacles when his foot divides Israel. He has to keep the feast, the foot feast, so his foot's going to land on that. And it's going to divide in two. Now, look at Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. The Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his what? His feet is going to stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west so that one half of the mountain will move north and the other half south. Okay, so think. The split is going to be east to west as it moves north to south. If you look at every report, the geological breaks are all north to south, the African rift. But here, this one is east to west from the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. And that's what causes the waters to flow into the Dead Sea to make it fresh again. And we see in Zechariah 14, 9, the Lord is going to be king over where? All the earth. And in verse 16 and 17, it says, if they don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, then guess what? They don't get any rain, which speaks of blessings. That's what it is. And then not only that, they also get the plague. Let me see. So here we have all the foot feasts. Everyone will be coming to Jerusalem for the three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. But now, get a load of this. Do you know, every year, during this time, guess what they read? They read the Torah portions that have to do with this, but they also read the Hoff Torah portion. And the Hoff Torah portion, look at your notes. What's the Hoff Torah portion? Ezekiel 38, 39, the Gog Magog War. The Jews believe the Gog Magog War is going to start on this day. Fascinating, a war started on this day. But I'm just telling you, this may be the precursor to the Gog Magog War. But every year, they believe the Gog Magog War will take place at the Feast of Tabernacles. Just like Jonah's story on Yom Kippur, it's been the 40 days of repentance, and then he goes sits in his sukkah, seeing because now judgment's going to get poured out. The timing of this is incredible with what is going on. Okay, with that said, what time is it? Oh, sorry, guys. Um, look at this. What is God's tactical warfare when he fights? Look at Ezekiel 38. It says, in my jealousy, in the fire of my wrath, I've spoken. Surely in that day there will be what? A great shaking. The fishes of the sea, the fowls of heaven, the beasts of the field, the creepy crawlers, and all the men upon the face of the earth will shake at my presence, and the mountains will be thrown down, the steep places will fall, and how many walls will fall to the ground? Every wall. Now, where are you supposed to be during the Feast of Booze? And a booth. It's a lot safer being in a sukkah than in a high-rise building during this time. Because high-rise building is going to fall. Who cares if your sukkah falls? Okay. And then it says, at the bottom it says, I will rain upon him. Rain, again, and upon his bands. You know, an overflowing rain. Isaiah 24, 
19 through 22. The earth is utterly broken, clean, dissolved. It's moving exceedingly. Wow. But here's the thing. God's plan for the nations is not to destroy them, but to bring them under his subjection. And why did God choose Sukkot as his test of obedience for Gentiles? The earth becomes God's sukkah as he reigns. It's to be the season of our joy, and it is taught that these events happen at the end of Sukkot, which is where we're at right now. But, it's, you know, the nations are to rejoice. They're commanded to rejoice, just like Israel is. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 40 through 43. God says, I'm going to lift my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies. You see in the Torah, he said he's going to render vengeance to his enemies. And he said he will give reward to those who hate them. Hate him. Okay. I don't know if they'll like the reward. But he's going to give reward to those who hate me, God says. And then he says, uh, I'll make my arrows drunk with blood. My sword will devour flesh and the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. And then here it is. During Sukkot, he says, rejoice, O you nations, with his people, because he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. And, but guess what? He's going to be merciful to his land and his people. Well, this is why in Romans 10, 15, 10 through 12, he quotes that verse. He says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And when is Israel commanded to rejoice? During the Feast of Tabernacles. And when are the nations to rejoice? During the Feast of Tabernacles, when the nations are being destroyed. It says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the people praise him. Again, even Isaiah says, there will be the root of Jesse who arises to rule over the Gentiles and in him with the Gentiles hope. You know what this is telling you? Jesse is from what tribe? Judah. David's from what tribe? Judah. Which where you get the word Jewish from. There's only one Jew who's going to arise to rule over the Gentiles and whom the Gentiles hope. He has to be the Messiah. There is no other Jew in history that all the Gentiles hope in and trust in. But look at Revelation 18, 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has finally avenged you. Going back to this verse. Matter of fact, at one place, they're crying out under the altar, when will you avenge our blood? And in Revelation 19, 2, true and righteous are his judgments. That speaks of the song of Moses. He has judged the great whore which corrupted the earth with the fornication, and he has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. A lot of people think that's only Christians. No, this comes from a verse in the Torah. We're talking about all the Jewish blood that has been shed. Now, during Sukkot, the meals are eaten outside. You're supposed to go in your sukkah, as you can see here, and have a meal. Well, why do you think the birds of the heaven are going outside during Sukkot to have a meal? There's going to be two wedding suppers. A wedding supper where you're sitting down and eating, and a wedding supper where you're sitting down being eaten. You get to decide what side of the table you want to be on. But that's in Ezekiel 39, which is part of this off to our portion again, which is why this happens. Here it talks about the great sacrifice of all the flesh of men and uh, horses. Well, that's Revelation 19, 17, and 18. It goes right along with Ezekiel 39 exactly, where he says, uh, saying to all the fowls, come and gather yourselves to the supper of the great God. You can eat the flesh of kings, captains. That is quoting Ezekiel 39, which is telling you that they're happening at the same time. This is the same event. And then, wow, okay, I'm, I'm almost done. Okay, uh, Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 3. Again, this is the blessing, it says. And it says, out of his right hand came a fiery law. He loves the people. All his holy ones are in your hand. They sat down at your feet. Each receives of your word. Moses commanded us a law, which is the inheritance of the assembly of Jacob. So here, he has this fiery law that he's given to us, but it's out of love, and it's actually the Torah that is the blessing that it says he's giving to us out of his right hand. It is the Torah. And it's given out of love. It's a law given by the king, but it's a law that is to be considered a blessing, not a curse. 
Look at Jeremiah 23, 29. God says, it's not my word like a fire, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. Proverbs 6, 23, the commandment is a lamp and the Torah is what? Light, okay, and the fire gives light. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 5, he was the king in Yeshurun, which is a nickname for Israel. And then in Deuteronomy 33, uh, 26 to 29, it says, uh, the eternal God is your dwelling place underneath are the everlasting arms. If I'm going to rest, I want to rest in the everlasting arms. Uh, Deuteronomy 34, 1, Moses goes up to uh, Mount Nebo to die. And this is right there is Mount Nebo. This is the very place where he looked over into Israel to see the promised land. And the Lord told him, sorry, it ain't happening. You're not going there. Uh, and so uh, Deuteronomy 34, 6 and 7, he dies, but he was still full of strength. Deuteronomy 34, 8, the children of Israel weep for him uh, for like 30 days. Uh, Joshua 1, 1 and 2, after that, uh, God goes to Moses and said, okay, Moses is dead. Let's move on. And in Joshua 1, 6 through 9, it says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous, it says, for you're going to cause the people to inherit the land as I swore to their fathers. And then again, he says, only be strong and very courageous to observe, to do everything according to the law. Don't turn from it from the right or the left that you can have success. Do you realize if you keep the law, you'll have success? Isn't that amazing? And then it says, the scroll of the Torah is not to depart out of your mouth. You're to meditate on it day and night uh, to do everything. Uh, that way your way will be prosperous. You'll have good success. Haven't I commanded you? And then the third time, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or dismayed because the Lord your God is going to go with you. And then Joshua gets the hint. And in chapter 1, verse 16 through 18, everyone answered Joshua. And he said, everything you command us will do. And wherever you send us will go. We'll listen to you just like we did to Moses. And Joshua goes, oh, no. Um, and then he says, just be strong and have good courage. Well, guess what? Here we are now ending the scroll. And next week we begin anew with Genesis 1.1. In the meantime, let's stand as we close in prayer. And we, at the end of every book, say this together. Just as God told Joshua and Joshua told the people, are you ready? Kazak, Kazak, Denit, Kazak. Be strong, be strong, and may we all be strengthened. Turn to someone and say, be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to pray. We're going to close with a uh, prayer here. Avinu Mokainu, our Father King, I just thank you again so much for all the people. And I'm tell asking right now, and I'm telling everyone that's here, that's live streaming from the U.S. and all over the world, be strong, be courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. Not only is he with you, he's your dad. He not only wants to bless you, he wants to put his name upon you. So I just thank you, Lord, for all the people who give to the success of your kingdom. We want your kingdom to come here on earth that your will would be done as it is in heaven. So I thank you so much for all those that are here, United States, around the world, that support this work to get the Torah taken to all the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Okay, there will be no Torah club meeting after the service today. It will pick up next week. So no Torah club after the service. Go get some snacks. This is known as what? Where's the Hallaman? Hallaman. Everyone here knows Mike the Hallaman. And uh, it's happy holidays. But look at his holla that he made. Yay for the Hallaman. Yes. Afterwards, you can all get a piece of that holla and some salt. Woohoo! That was great, Mike. 
Okay, yesterday was actually Hoshana Rabbah, which is the seventh day. Today is Shemini Atzeret, the eighth day. And tomorrow is Simchat Torah. Now, when you're out of the land, it's different to when it's in the land. Today in the land is Simchat Torah as well as Shemini Atzeret. But it's, this weekend is so significant. And I want to talk a little bit today about the eighth day and its significance. I mean, what's amazing to me, when you're on the biblical calendar, you can look at historically what literally happened on this day. It's the anniversary. But let's start with Leviticus 23 and verse 26. Notice this. It says, seven days you're to offer a fire offering to the Lord. This is during Sukkot. And then on the eighth day, wow, that's separate because it's only seven days long. And now they're talking about an eighth day. It's to be a, a holy convocation or assembly or dress rehearsal. And you're to offer a, firing, a fire offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. And guess what the Hebrew word for assembly is? Atzeret. Shemini is eight. Atzeret is assembly. Now they often ask, well, why does God have the eighth day after the seven days of Sukkot. It's much like when you have all of the relatives come uh, for a, a big holiday get together. People come from all of the United States to come and meet you at your house, all your siblings and parents and grandparents. And then the party's over and everyone's leaving and you ask your best friend, sister, brother, would you stay one more day? That's kind of like what the eighth day is. God is asking those that are really committed, can you just stay one more day? I, I hate to see you go. And that's kind of like what uh, this is. Now, in 2 Peter 3, 12 and 13, look what he said. He's looking forward and hasting to the coming of the day of God, where in the heavens being on fire will be dissolved. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Like I talked about last week, there's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. And you're going to have a new body. How many of you are ready for one of those? <laughs> yeah, amen. But he's quoting Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. He says, as the new heavens and the new earth that I make will remain before me, says the Lord. He says to David, basically, so shall your offspring and your name remain. And then he says, from, this is after the new heavens and the new earth. He says, from one new moon to new moon, from one Sabbath to the next Sabbath, everybody's going to come and worship before me, declares the Lord. Here's the thing. We can read that, but people wonder if it's true. And as Peter said, look, your word is true. Either we trust him or we don't trust him. I mean, this is a written word, but we believe it's from the prophets concerning God. And how many believe if, he raises, if God raises his right hand and swears this is going to happen? It's going to happen. Look at Leviticus 23, 39. He says, in the 15th day of the seventh month, which is Tishri 15, it begins the Feast of Sukkot. When you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you are to keep a feast for seven days. The first day is a Sabbath, and the eighth day is a Sabbath. And it so happens, today, the eighth day, which is a Sabbath, falls on a Sabbath. So it's like a double blessing today. Now, if you remember, a day with the Lord is how many years? And so the eighth day also is how many years? Well, what's interesting, let's look at Revelation 20, 1 through 5. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that old ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. And in case you didn't know, Satan means the adversary in Hebrew. It's the adversary. And he bound him for how many years? which is one day. This is the seventh day. 
He binds it for a thousand years, threw him in a pit, shut it, sealed it, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. This is the millennial reign. This is the seventh day. After that, he has to be released for just a little bit. And then I saw a throne. Seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Oh, my gosh. Messiah is going to judge everything. But here it says he's giving the authority to some humans also. I, I think specifically that's referring to the 12 apostles, the original 12. But let's see. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Yeshua and for the word of God. So here are believers who have the testimony of Yeshua who also have uh, the word of God they believe in, but they get beheaded. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image or had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. And guess what? They died, but they get to come back to life and they reign with Messiah for how long? A thousand years. But the rest of those that were dead didn't come to life until the eighth day. The thousand years were ended. And so this is the first resurrection, all those who come alive and reign with Messiah for a thousand years. So that's the seventh day. Now I want to bring this out. In Revelation 26 through 8, it says, Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. And guess what? Those who are in the first resurrection get to be priests of God and of his Messiah, and they'll reign with him for a thousand years. And then when the thousand years are ended, and the sentence will be released from prison. And then he's going to come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle, and their number is like the sand of the sea. Okay, let me show you something. How many nations are there? that the Bible says, 70. Well, guess what? If you add up the numerical value of the phrase Gog and Magog, you get exactly 70. And that's why they say all nations are gonna be coming against Israel at this time. You can see the Gimel, uh, you have four Gimels and they're three apiece. You have three Vavs, which are six apiece, and the Mem is 40, and it adds up to, say, uh, to 70. And therefore they believe that the Gog-Magog war will involve all nations, which is basically what you see. Now, this is why they would kill 70 bulls during Sukkot, one bull for every nation. <clears throat> but here's the thing you have to realize. There are two Gog and Magog wars. There's a Gog and Magog war right at the beginning of the thousand-year reign, and then there's another Gog and Magog war at the end of the thousand-year reign. So there's two Gog and Magog wars you see the one that happens uh before the thousand year reign is in uh revelation uh i think 19 18 and ezekiel 39 17 and 18 and in both those places is where all the birds of the air come and feast on the flesh of horses and kings and captains and all that that is the first magog war and then you find in revelation at the end of the thousand years as we just read, there is a, another Magog, Gog and Magog war. Why? Because prophecies repeat. It's not linear. It is cyclical. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> let me mention this. Let me see. Okay. In Revelation 20, let's look at verses 11 through 15. He sees a great white throne and him who seated on it. From his presence, the earth and the sky fled. There was no place found for them. Can you imagine? He walks in the room and the entire earth and heavens all pass away. They go, well, I'm out of here. And then it says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. What comes to your mind when you hear the books were opened? Rosh Hashanah. That's when the books are open. Yom Kippur is when the books are closed. This is telling you this is going to happen on Rosh Hashanah. See, Rosh Hashanah is going to be fulfilled over and over and over and over. I believe the seven trumpets of Revelation all happen on Rosh Hashanah, one each Rosh Hashanah for seven years. And then what happens? Then what do we see? At the end, here comes another Rosh Hashanah, and the books are open. And then another book is open, the book of life. 
And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And then the sea gives up the dead. Death and Hades had to give up their dead. And then those people were judged according to what they had done. And then death itself and the grave is thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And that's for those who were not found written in the book of life. Now look at Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Then what does he see? A new heaven and a new earth, which is the eighth day. So the Olivia reign has ended. Now it's the eighth day. He sees the new heaven, the new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then hears a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. See, this is the Feast of Tabernacles when he tabernacles among men. I want to teach you when you're reading the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, the way you can study is compare phrases to phrases. And that's how you know it's their correlations. And then it says, uh, and this is also a quote from Isaiah 25, I believe. Uh, but it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, crying, or pain. The former things have passed away. Okay, the eighth day or the eighth millennium is what it becomes, is like the first day. So the eighth day speaks of new beginnings. Just like you have a seven day week, the first day is also the eighth day. Does that make sense? Now look at Revelation 21, nine through 14. Here comes the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and it says hey i'm going to show you the bride the wife of the lamb carry me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and show me the holy city jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god having the glory of god its radiance was like a most rare jewel like jasper clear as crystal it had a big high wall with 12 gates and at the 12 gates were 12 angels and on the gates were the name of the 12 denominations of christianity oh no Oh, my word. That's not what it says. The names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And on the east three gates, on the north three, south three, west three, the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names of the who? The 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay. It says here <clears throat> that the 12 gates on the east, south, west, and north were after the tribes of Israel. Do you think they're in the same order as they were around Moses' tabernacle? Or are they in a different order? Okay, in case you were wondering, <clears throat> on the east was all Leah's kids. On the south is all Leah's kids and uh, Zilpah's kids, her handmaid. On the east is all Rachel's, or west, I mean, on the west is all of Rachel's kids, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, and then on the north, is Bilhah's kids, Dan and Naphtali, but there's also Asher, who is uh, Zilpah's. But it, basically, it's Leah, Leah, Rachel, Rachel, going around. Well, let's look what happens. Did you know the Bible tells you from Re in Revelation? Or in Revelation, it mentions the 12 gates and the 12 tribes, but it doesn't mention the order. Do you know where you find the order? Everything, nothing new in the New Testament. There's nothing new in the New Testament. It's all prophesied in the Old Testament. So you go to the Old Testament to find out what the New Testament is leaving out. Look at your notes. Ezekiel 48, 30 through 34. These will be the exits of the, exits of the city. On the north, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates. And here we have the gate of Reuben. Reuben was on the south before. And now he's, okay, on the north. And then the gate of Judah. Well, Judah was on the east. And the gate of Levi, they never had a gate because they were in the middle. And then it says, <clears throat> uh, the gates of the city are named after the tribes of Israel. On the east side, which used to have Judah, uh, Issachar, and Zebulun, all right, who's there now? On the east side is the gate of Joseph. Ephraim of Manasseh isn't divided anymore. So you have the gate of Joseph, the gate of Benjamin, and the gate of Dan. That is Bilhah's son, uh, Rachel's handmaid. So Rachel, who was on the west, 
Now, Joseph is on the east. Benjamin is on the east. I mean, there's no one from, Le- uh, from Leah at all. Leah's children aren't on the east. This time, it's Rachel's children. And then we see on the south side now uh, is Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulun. Now, they are all Leah's kids. And then on the west side is three gates for Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. That's all the uh, handmaids' kids. So everything is getting shifted around. And uh, if you go back to Ezekiel 38, 1 through 3, here it talks about the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshach and Tuval, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Okay, now, Gog. What does the Hebrew word Gog or Gog mean? Does anyone know what it means? I will show you in your Bible. Are you ready? Look at Deuteronomy 22.8. When you build a new house, then you should make a battlement for your what? Roof, roof, however you say it. If you're from Kansas, it's roof. If you're from Washington, it's roof. Roof, roof. Okay? But the Hebrew word is gog. Now, what's fascinating, when you think of a roof over your house, you're thinking of something that is strong, that protects you from the elements of heaven. But we are in our little sukkah where you can see the stars and you're trusting in God for your protection, not what man builds. This is why the Battle of Gog and Magog will take place during the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the battle of the strong house with a prideful roof against the humility of the sukkah with its weak, unstable covering. Are we going to trust in what man builds at this time, or are we going to trust in what God commands us to do? The whole history of mankind consists of this contrast. Is our security going to be found in what we build, or will we trust in God? The battle of the strong house with a prideful roof against the humility of the sukkah with its weak, unstable covering. The roof or roof represents the philosophy that man can insulate himself against the heavenly power of God. We just put them out of our mind. We'll put a roof up. We won't see the heavens. We, you know, because the heavens are always speaking about God. And so we're just going to put a roof over our house. Magog is a place and it represents those who attempt to project this philosophy on earth so gog and magog represent the forces of evil who are intent on destroying the people of god now we know from habakkuk 2 12 the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the lord as the waters cover the sea now with that said let me show you something that i came up with Late yesterday. Okay, Monday, and we see Sunday is the first day of the week. Blue, Sunday, blue, first day of the week. Monday, the second day of the week, red, third day, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. You see Sunday through Saturday. Each is the first day of the week, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh day of the week. But now, A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So now I want you to look at this in terms of thousands of years, not just days. But one more thing as days, see, this is like a calendar, whatever month you want to choose. So the eighth day is still the first day of the next week. Do you see that? And the 15th is the first day of a new week. And the 22nd is the new day of the next week. And the 29th is. So every first can also be uh, the 8th or the 15th, depending on when you start. Does that make sense? Just like when you have the Shemitah cycles for 49 years. You have the, the first week, which ends with 7. The next week ends with 14. You follow me? Now, what I've done, I created 1,000 years so the first is the year zero to 999. So the second day is going to be the years 1,000 to 1999. 2,000 to 299, 3, 4, 5. And the seventh day is 6,000 to 6999. Now, a lot of people, how can the year six something be the seventh? 
Because zero is the first. You're not one years old until you've completed it. So if you're 1.5 years old, you are over here. Okay? And if you're, uh, are you following me? So uh, if you're two years old, you're somewhere between 1,000 and 1,999. So the third century is the years 200. The fourth century is the years 300. I hope that makes sense. I, I don't want it to be mathematically confusing. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, like this is the 21st century, but it's 2,000 something. Yeah, that, but that's the reason why, because it starts with zero, not one. See, mathematically, historically, <clears throat> they didn't have uh, even the year A.D., oh gosh, until about the year 800 did they come up with it. And then they didn't have B.C. for another couple hundred years. They never, and, and when they did it, they forgot the year zero. So we go from 1 A.D. to 1 B.C., forgetting 1 to 0 and 0 to 1. That's why our calendar's so screwed up. Okay, but is everyone kind of understanding now? Okay, so right now we are in the year what? 5784. Does everyone see that little 57 in the sixth day in the purple under the 5999? So if we're in 5784, we are getting close to the end of the sixth day. Not the beginning of the sixth day. Does, everyone, does that make sense? 5784? That means we're how many years into the sixth day? 784. Does that make sense? We are in the sixth day now. Matter of fact, we are 784 years into the sixth day. Does everyone understand that? 5784, 784 means it's 784 since 5,000. That's how you add. Okay, now, we are, does everyone understand we're in the year 5784 by looking at the biblical calendar? Does everyone understand that's at the end of the sixth day, about to begin the seventh day, which begins with the year 6,000? Right? Okay, now watch this. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, which means a thousand years equals 24 hours. Right? Does a day equal 24 hours? So a thousand years equals 24 hours. So when you divide that, you find one hour to God is 41.66 years. You take 41.66 times 24, you're going to get a thousand. Is that what following me? One hour is about 42 years is an hour to God. Well, guess what? If you know the military clock, 7 p.m. is the 19th hour, right? You got 12, you got 7, that's the 19th. All right, and that's when sun sets in Israel at Rosh Hashanah is 7 p.m. Well, what's fascinating, you take the 19th hour times the 41.66 years, that's 791 years, okay? 791 begins the seventh millennium. And we are at, uh, we're at 5784. Well, the year 5791 is sunset of the sixth day and the seventh day begins. And so 7 p.m. is 5791 or 2030. The year 2030 on our calendar it's not, you don't have to wait till the year 6,000 because in the Bible, it's evening and morning, day one. And so the seventh day begins at sunset of the sixth day, which is the year 5791, which is 2030 on our calendar, which is the end of this Shemitah cycle. What year did the Lord die? The year 30. Right? Well, what happens in the year 2030, that's 2,000 years or two days. And in Hosea, after two days, I will raise you up and you will live in my sight. Now, so what do we have here? Here we have a new Shemitah cycle begins as well as a new Jubilee cycle. 2023 was the year of Jubilee. Okay, this is like new beginnings. 
And then what happens, we're entering 2024, and I have them combined, 2026, 2033, because I want you to know the biblical calendar isn't the same as our calendar, because they, they come together in October of every year. Okay, we just ended a year of Jubilee. We're now entering 5784. Well, Hosea 5.14. I will be like a lion to Ephraim, a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and where? Go away. I will carry off and then will rescue. This is the Messiah. Israel was destroyed, right? And he went ahead and he took off. And then the next verse. But I will return again, he says, to my place, back to the heavenlies. Until when? Until Israel acknowledges their guilt and they seek my face in their distress, they will earnestly Seek me, which is Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, they will seek him and realize Yeshua is the Messiah. But here we see he goes away in 30 AD. But then he's going to return. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. The third day is significant. That goes back to Exodus 19. When God came down on Sinai at Shavuot, he said, be ready for the third day day okay and here we see the third day he will raise us up just like he was raised up on the third literal day and so uh i find it very fascinating that i believe we are right now in that week which is a time am I gonna, let me see where i'm at yeah which is the time of war i mentioned about in the opening this is when all of the eclipses are taking place it's a war cycle that we're in, the seven years. I don't think Yeshua is coming within the next seven years, but I think this is that week before, just like the week before Noah's flood, you had Methuselah died, and they were sitting Shiva for seven days or seven years. I believe this next seven years, God is giving us to, for the biggest revival we ever have seen that's going to take place, and then at the beginning of the new cycle, he will raise us up, and we will live in a sight, and then there you have the tribulation, going through there now where am i at okay i'll try to speed up but i hope you're following along with me okay let's jump down um, to numbers 33 5 on your notes here here we see well, let's go to Leviticus 23, 42 and 43. The whole reason they were to have booths for seven days was, it says, because he wanted all the generations to know that he had Israel dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. So what happens? Israel flees Egypt with a high hand to enter the promised land, and it just so happens their first stop. What was their first stop before they crossed the Red Sea? And Numbers 33, 5. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses and pitched where? In Sukkot. Imagine that. There's a Sukkot in Egypt even. And guess what? They were living in tents. Okay? They didn't have homes. They were on the run. They've only been there for a day. But I want you to think about this for a minute. This is so incredible. How long had they been in Egypt? Does anyone remember? 210 years. And they left the same day they went in. That's God's patterns. Same day. Now, they had 200 years of roots. Think about roots. If you, your whole family lived in the same place for 200 years, that's a long time. That's like the beginning of America. From 1776 to 1976, 200 years, you'd feel like you're an American if you've been here for 200 years, you know, with all of your family. Well, guess what? In Egypt, they at least had the security of the roof, Gog, over them. Okay? They had food. Even though they as a people were not free, they were slaves, but they were glad they had a roof over their head and they had food. Okay? They felt they at least had peace and security, even though they couldn't come and go as they pleased. During COVID, we could not come and go as we please, but did we feel like we had liberties? <laughs> now, just think about that for a minute. 
This was one of the biggest psychological choices that could ever be made by a simple people group. Many would soon regret it. Follow me here. Look at Numbers 11, 5 through 6. They're in the wilderness. They're free from Egypt. And what do they say? We remember the fish which the Egyptian government gave us for free, like a guaranteed income. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, but now our soul is dried up. There's nothing at all besides this stinking manna. They don't remember the Holocaust of their children. That's a bad memory. But guess what? That happened 80 years earlier. Do you realize? That was a long time. And look at this. Because if you remember, when the children, they were being killed when Moses was born. Well, now he's 80 when he's leading them out to go into the wilderness for another 40 years. The Holocaust happened 80 years earlier. And do you know the Holocaust started in 1945? We're exactly 80 years from that in 2025. And they're already saying it. the Holocaust never happened in many places. We're at the same place. But look at this. Exodus 12, 37 to 39. The children, again, journey from Ramesses to Sukkot. Look how many there were. 600,000 men. Well, then you got all their wives, and then you've got all their children. And then in addition to that, there was a mixed multitude, and they had all of their flocks and herds and lots of cattle, and they baked unleavened bread. Uh, And it wasn't leavened because they had to get out of there really quickly. Well, you know what? There, did you know there's a connection between Passover and Sukkot? They're both full moons, all right? But it's also based on perspective. What we are to remember is two things. The food that was eaten, unleavened bread, and where they sheltered that first night of freedom, a place called Sukkot. So here they're leaving on Passover, and the first place they settle is Sukkot. Freedom and liberty, and now you are depending on God. You following me? So this is the understanding. Two basic needs were met. Food and shelter. All right? That's what they had in Egypt was food and shelter, but they didn't have any freedom. What is more important to us, food and shelter or freedom? That's what we have to think about. Listen to Matthew 6.25. Therefore, I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink, what you're going to clothe yourself with. Life is more than food and raiment. The birds of the air, they don't sow anything. They don't reap anything. They don't gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Don't you think you're better than they are? And then it goes on to say in verse 30 through 33, Wherefore, if God clothes clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Take no thought, saying, What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Or how are we going to be clothed? For after all these things is what the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. You seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. Now, think about this. Here we go. We have the governments now talking about a universal basic income. We're just going to give everybody $1,000. 900 plus Americans share their opinions on a guaranteed salary for all citizens. You put in universal basic income in your Google, you're going to find all kinds of things. People about, or people talking about, we just need The problem is not enough money. Let's just print more money, give everybody a certain amount of money, and then it's like socialism or communism. Well, guess what? Israel made the choice to embrace freedom over having the Egyptian government supply their needs. True freedom, here we go, true freedom is breaking the chains of government control over your life. That's what it is. That's what it is. This was a turning point in the history of Israel. And this is the same choice America now faces. 
And, and so I, I see that what's coming is they're going to want the government, if they give you money to meet your needs, they control you. They control you. It's always about money and power. If you got money, you can control. That's what it comes down to. People want to have control over you, and they know most. Look what's happening right now. A lot of people aren't going to work. They're just living on government assistance, and they're happy with that because their needs are met. I want to be free. Huge difference. So here, someone is drowning, and you're asking for a hand. And you say, well, here's some garlic, leeks, and onions. If you're drowning, what good is the garlic, leeks, and onions? What you need is a life preserver. Okay, and th this is the thing. Here, they were whining. All they remembered was what the government supplied them with. This is horrible. But history repeats itself. It's cyclical. We're coming back to that very same point. So here we are <clears throat> on Simchat Torah. Tamini Atzeret was to be a day of rejoicing in the Torah, God's law. Well, John chapter 8, significantly, which is the eighth day, John 7 is the Feast of Tabernacles, and then it says on the next day, uh, it's Simchat Torah, and instead of rejoicing in the Torah, we see John 8, on the very day of rejoicing in the Torah, the Pharisees are trying to justify killing someone based on their wrong interpretation of the Torah. Here we are, John 8, 3 through 5. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman taken in adultery. Having set her in the midst, they said, Rabbi, we found this woman in adultery in the very act. Well, guess what? Then they say, well, now our Torah commanded, uh, Moses commanded us to stone her. What do you have to say? In other words, tell us what the word of the Lord is here, fella. Well, what's amazing, according to the Torah, here she's caught in a very act, you're supposed to bring the man. Where's the man? Well, the man might have been one there standing trying to accuse. More than likely, it was one of the rabbis. Okay, and here they are pointing the finger at her, and they want the Lord to justify their wrong interpretation of Torah. Okay. Well, let's look at this. In Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 19, let's look what Moses said. If a false witness rises up against anyone to testify against him that which is wrong, then both of the people between the whom the controversy is will stand before the Lord. And that's what they were doing right there in John chapter 8. Before the priests and the judges, which will be in those days, and the judges are to make diligent inquisition. So what is Yeshua doing? He's making diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness is a false witness and testified falsely, then you will do to them as they had thought to do to their brother and not tell you put evil away. We'll look at Leviticus 20.10. The man that commits adultery with another man's wife, even he that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Okay, well, if they got her, where's him? So they're not even following the Torah. Okay, so now Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 3, I've already read it. Remember, here in Deuteronomy 33, verse 1 through 3, talking about the blessing. At his right hand was the fiery law. He loves the people, all the holy ones, and they sat down at your feet. Well, guess what? Every Feast of Tabernacles, this is the Torah portion. Well, guess what happens? It's the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeshua is sitting in the Temple Mount. His disciples are at his feet. Look at this, John 7, 37, 38. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Hoshana Rabbah, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, come to me. Out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then in verse 47 through 49, the Pharisees answered uh, the soldiers that didn't arrest Jesus. Why didn't you arrest him? And they say, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. In other words, these leaders, priestly leaders, have just forsaken the fountain of living waters. Yeshua proclaimed he's the fountain of living waters. They reject the fountain of living waters. Now look at Numbers 5. This concerns the sota. I don't know how many heard of the sota, but this is where a husband accuses his wife of a... You okay? Good? Okay, if a husband 
thinks his wife has been fooling around, he takes her to the priests and the judges, and they make her drink a portion of water, and if she's not guilty, she ends up having a baby. So a lot of times, barren couples would do that just so they'd have a baby. Kind of interesting. But aside from that, here, look at what happens. If you've gone astray, you are under your husband's authority. If you've defiled yourself and some other man other than your husband has lain with you, then let the priest make the woman take an oath of a curse and say to the woman, the Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people when the Lord makes your thigh fall away, your body swell. May this water that brings the curse pass into your bowels and make your womb swell, your thigh fall away. And the woman will say, let it happen. And then the priest writes the curses in a book, washes them off into the waters of bitterness, and he makes the woman drink the water of bitterness that brings the curse, and the water that brings the curse will enter into her and cause bitter pain. Okay, now, it's very innocuous. Water and uh, paper. You don't die from water and paper. Okay, so obviously, God is going to do something. But here's the thing. If it was true, and she dies this death, so does the adulterer. They both die. Even if he's not even there, he's going to die just like she dies. They both get the same penalty. And if she's not guilty, guess what? She produces life. Why? Because part of the curse has the name of God written on it, and you're not supposed to erase God's name, but God so values the innocent wife that he's willing to have his name erased to prove her innocence. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so now, look at John chapter 8, verse 6 through 8. Okay, I'm going to show you this picture. These are actual tiles they found from the temple, uh, on the Temple Mount, Herod's, from Herod's temple. Here's Yeshua riding on the ground. Now, obviously these stones here don't have this pattern, but in the real temple they had these patterns. And one of the stones could be picked up and moved so that the dirt could be seen. That is the dirt that the Soto woman would be subject to. The one special marble floor piece would be picked up. They take the water, they take the dirt from that place, put it in the water and mix it all up and she drink it. Okay, well, here's a woman who's caught in adultery. It's the very same thing as the Sota. All right, and what does he do? He takes his finger and he writes in the dirt. He was writing exactly in the dirt of the Sota woman. There was no dirt in the temple. They were all marble floors. He picked up the very marble plate for the Sotal woman that would be guilty of committing adultery. Here, this woman's being committed of adultery. And instead of doing the living water, he's the living water. And he's mixing the living water with himself in the dirt that they just rejected as the living water. Then, what do we find? John 8... Six through eight, they said this testing him that they might have some reason to accuse him, but she was stooped down. And he wrote on the ground with his finger, but when they continued asking him, he looked up and he said to them, whoever's without sin, throw the first stone at her. And then he stooped down with his finger and started writing on the ground again. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning to the eldest, even into the last. Here they are, they're totally ashamed, and just the day before, they had rejected the fountain of living waters. Did you ever wonder what he was writing in the dirt? I can tell you. Where do you find it? Back in the Old Testament. You got to link them together. Listen to Jeremiah 17, 13, and 14. It says, O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake you will be what? A shame. And those that depart from me shall be what? written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. That's right there. And then what? I can see her, this woman caught in adultery saying, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved for you are my praise. Today is the anniversary of that very event. Today is the eighth day. Today is the very day that that event happened. 
That's why I love the biblical calendar. You can tie the biblical stories to the events. So let's stand and pray. Yeah, sure. You got a song? I think we have a closing song. So we're going to have the closing song, and then I'll say the priestly blessing. Next week, Genesis 1. I've got some phenomenal stuff for y'all. Let's close in prayer. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much. We love you so much. My goodness, when we look at history and the patterns of history and how you do everything in history on specific days, and that's how we know it's you. God, give us all seeing eyes, hearing ears, hearts to understand what you're speaking to us at this time. We love you. We praise you. We just thank you so much that you not only love us, you want to put your name upon us as you told Moses to tell Aaron to say. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Eye, I share. Eye. See you next week. <laughs>